Have you ever wondered if it's possible to live in sync with your cycle? Do you struggle with a negative mindset around your period? Are you wondering if it's possible to be feminist and anti-birth control? We're going to explore these questions and so much more in the Managing Your Fertility podcast, because this is about helping you live a whole and full life. I'm your host and guide, Bridget Busacker, joining you in this journey of exploration related to women's health care, feminism, and fertility awareness. Are you ready? Let's get started. Before we jump into this week's episode, I want you to know about my course, Start Your Chart. Did you ever wonder if you could live in sync with your body and not fight against it? Maybe you thought that you would love to embrace your fertility rather than turn it off. Are you just tired of living and conforming to life like a man when you're a rock star woman? I created Start Your Chart to help women embrace their bodies, love their fertility and hormones, and be a strong woman in a world that freaking needs us at the table with everything we bring as women, not tiny men. Can we say it again for the people in the back? Start Your Chart is all about learning how to start charting, and I walk you through the process, helping you build the skills you need to chart in confidence and clarity. Body confidence, period peace, and clarity are meant for you. You have what you need to do this. I'm here to help you learn, unleash the power you already hold, and step boldly into the dignity of your personhood as a beautiful, unique woman. You are needed at your full potential and full capacity, and embracing your body and your fertility is a huge step in doing this. An integrated life isn't for the few or elite. It's for you. It is for every single woman. Are you ready to do this? For $37, you get lifetime access to the course, bonus materials, and the opportunity to change your life. That's a total of six fancy lattes. So doable and totally for you. This course is for any woman who needs help getting started with charting and taking the steps to understand their health. Whether you're starting to chart for the first time, you're engaged and required to take an NFP course, and you need help picking out a method that's best for you, or you're getting started again after a hiatus of charting, this course is for you. It specifically focuses on the science, and while it's in alignment with Catholic Church teaching, I do not go into the specifics of theology or spiritual support for the practice of NFP. So this course is really, truly for every single woman. If you're ready to jump in, the link is in the show notes so you can make your purchase today. This is how we change women's health, by you and me understanding our bodies, learning our bodies, and embracing our full potential as women. Hi, Danny. Welcome to the show. I'm so excited to have you on and joining me in this conversation today. Hi, I am so excited to be here and to chat with you. So before we jump into our topic around your own journey and your journey with foster care, I'd love for you to share more about who you are and you know, just a little bit of your family life and beyond, beyond the Instagram page that you run so beautifully in your ministry. Okay. So my name is Danielle Thompson. My ter- my husband is Terry Thompson and, uh, we live in South Louisiana. We just welcomed, um, two foster babies into our home last October. Oh my gosh. So exciting. So can you tell us more about your own story with fertility awareness and your journey that led you to foster care? Because it's a topic that I I have to say personally for listeners, like I don't know a lot about, and you've shared so much and so beautifully on social media of your journey that I'd really love to shed more light onto this, this topic and this choice to make in welcoming children into your family in in a more unique setting that some I think are really unfamiliar with who are listening. Yes, of course. So, um, about four months into our marriage, I stopped having periods and I thought that it was just, um, the stress of my husband working away because he was in the oil field. Um, I've always just, at that point in time, I was like, let my body just take its course. I really wasn't concerned. Um, it wasn't, and that was in May of 2015. By the time the holidays came around and I wasn't having a cycle, um, I really started to get concerned and my doctor's office was not really pursuing, like helping me um, pursue any type of like testing. And it was really difficult. Every time I would call, they would tell me, um, just let's wait till you start your period so we could do like some labs for a day two, three, and four. And I'm like, I'm not having any. 
period. So <laughs> it was really frustrating. And it was around that time that I heard about NAPRO technology. And it was through NAPRO in January 2016 that I started my path with them. And I was I charted for about not even two months, not even the duration that they require before they really start digging in, into things. My um, my crate model practitioner, she told me right away, you just need we need to send you to a NAPRO doctor and have testing done. Mm -hmm. And so through there, I um, in May of 2016, a full year later. I was, I received a diagnosis, which I do not receive in Jesus name, um, premature ovarian failure. And a year, about a year later, the following summer is when I did some, um, we, I went back to NAPRO and we did some follicular tracking and we played around with some, um, hormone replacement therapy to see if we could induce some ovulation. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, that, and, and my journey with NAPRO kinds, kind of ends there, but I continue to advocate for it. So from there, uh, after we walked away from our NAPRO clinic, because it was actually sh shutting down, it was closing down. Mm -hmm. um, I just had this faith to just believe, to just believe for a healing, to believe that Jesus, who is our healer, would heal me. And um, from there, birthed a lot of faith. And uh, so I just continued to walk forward. And it was during that time that I really, really started to share about my faith in fertility um, through my NAPRO technology journey, crate model journey. And at this point in time, just believing for a miraculous healing. And um, I attended a, a conference that was so, so, so powerful for fertility. And when I came home from that conference, I wanted, I wanted to bring something like that to the Catholic faith, to the Catholic church. Um, because being in this community, I know that there could be a lack in our church parishes. Um, for supporting couples who are struggling with infertility. And um, so I'm going to come back to this part of my story, but I want to go into how around this time, me and my husband were also considering adoption. And so we started to pursue adoption and we ended up going with a consultant and we ended up walking away from this consultant just because this is where I started to really learn about the um, ethics of adoption and how important it is to really research who you're going to work with, um, whether that's a consultant, an agency, an attorney. Um, you, need, you need to work with people who care about birth families and expectant moms. Mm -hmm. And uh, so when we walked away from that, we were in a place where Terry had to make a decision if he was going to continue working away in the oil field or if he was go going to come home. And I really needed him to come home um, because at this point it had been about, I think, five years of our marriage of him working two thirds of the year away while we're trying to build a family, while we're trying to adopt, while I'm trying to receive a healing for my body. And so he came home and our life kind of just changed in the best of ways. And at that point, I really just wanted to focus on fertility. And um, I, I felt God tell us that in order for him to increase, we need, need it to decrease. Mm -hmm. And I took that as lifestyle. Um, so we sold our house, we bought a, a smaller house, but at the same time, it's so much more than of a home than our other previous home was and offers so much more to us as a family and with our hobbies. And Terry, he's a duck hunter and now he has a shop and 
place, a place to store everything. Um, also his job, he, he took the one that he took here. Um, it was, it was also a change financially. And so we had to trust in God with that. And so through all of that, we started to pursue, um, we started to pursue a more functional approach to fertility care mm -hmm. and just getting my whole body looked at and seeing what's going on. And, and we did find some answers and it, we were, I, this was last summer and I was so focused on just, um, just walking in this healing and walking through functional medicine with my Catholic doctor who she is Catholic. She's amazing. She prays over us every time we go. Mm -hmm. And it was through there, through that season, when we were introduced to a foster care situation, I was not thinking about um, adoption or foster care in this time. Um, I was really just focused on my fertility. Mm -hmm. And so when this was presented to us, um, we received pictures of the two babies. And at the time they were about to be one and about to be three. So very, very young. And they shared our names and they shared their names with us. And I went look up the meaning and their names mean precious increase. So God was calling us from a season of to decrease so he could increase. And then he sends these two babies who needed a place and a family and that's their names. So to kind of, so that's where, that's how foster care came to us, but to kind of backtrack back to the conference that I was talking about, um, this was a, about three years ago. So three years back into the story. Um, when I came home from that conference, I went talk to Father Joshua Johnson, who was currently at Holy Rosary Catholic Church, which is near where I live. And I just was so excited. And I said, I want to bring a conference. I want to um, bring the power of the Holy Spirit and just faith for couples who are struggling with infertility. And I'm, I'm just thinking we could have like resources there for them. We could have prayer warriors there. Like just, I, I just had this vision and he was, he was so excited about it too. But he told me, he said, look, he said, I am someone who thinks big dreams, big, but I've learned that we have to start small. So why don't you start a support group? And I was, I left feeling <laughs> so disappointed I'm like this is not what God has I feel that God has placed on my heart this is not what he is calling me to and so I left um encouraged and discouraged at the same time um so to fast forward again to over a year ago um which was last February I was walking in probably the lowest season of my journey that I had been. My brother and sister-in-law just announced their pregnancy after only being married a couple of months. So that would be my mom and dad's first grandchildren, first grandchild. And um, I just, I was in our, our brand new home that we just renovated. We had just moved in um, and I had, we, we, we're entering into this new time of our lives, but I just felt so broken mm -hmm. and I felt so, um, just so low and depression was trying to creep in. I remember anxiety was starting to physically take, um, to like manifest in my body, um, where every time I would get in the car, my heart would race. I, I just was in a, in such a, physical and mental and spiritual low. Um, and I felt God tell me you need to be what you need. You need to be for others what you were desiring for yourself. And so at that time, two of my best friends started to walk through their infertility stories. 
And it was, it was them that really, I felt like I needed to be there for them. And so I started, God called me to this ministry and I told God, okay, I need a name. And I um, started studying the women in the Bible who struggled with infertility. I went Mm -hmm. to Hannah and I went to Sarah and none, nothing really stuck out to me. And then I was like, this is going to be a Catholic ministry. And what is more Catholic than Elizabeth's story? Because she, because of Mary. So um, I read, I went in to read the visitation between Mary and Elizabeth and all throughout their story, the, the word favor is written Mm. and favor just stuck out to me because when you're dealing with infertility, you feel anything but favored. And Mm. so, um, that, that is the birth of favor. And a week after one of my best friends who were, was struggling conceived and now has a baby boy. So, yeah. So I believe that wraps up the two stories of my ministry and how we were led to foster care. Wow. That is so powerful in the ways that God was speaking to you. And just how you said that you had this moment of God asking you to decrease and then to send you to, I had chills hearing that he sent you <laughs> beautiful children and it means to increase mm-hmm. and just to see in the ways in which like God is still a part of your story, even in those moments when it does feel low, when it does feel hard. And when you're struggling that he's still in those spaces and in that brokenness that you can feel. Yeah. And the yeah. story of your ministry, I had, I, that I just love that and how <laughs> you went to scripture and seeing, okay, what do these women have to share with me? What do these women have to show me? Yeah. And to get to that point and recognizing, okay, how can I not only have the support of the blessed mother, but how could I be a Mary to someone else too mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and walk with them? Yeah. So what was it like for you, you know, jumping into your story with foster care, you said you, you looked at adoption and you realized, okay, you really have to be conscientious of who you choose for an attorney and agency, or, um, what was the other area that you had um, said? You could do a, you could do attorney agency or a consultant. Okay. And you guys had went the consultant route and realized that it wasn't for you. Yeah. At what yeah. point did you realize foster care made more sense? What was that difference that you noticed practically, but then maybe also like, you know, some of that heart check too. Yeah. So when we walked away from adoption, it was a very devastating time because of there were news articles coming out, um, about just the adoption industry in general and how some like how who we were working with played a part in it and they weren't the only ones it it was nationwide and it just was very eye-opening to me and so from there I, I because I wanted I wanted like you said a heart check I wanted to know that what we were doing would be in the right way in the best way Mm -hmm. and so instead of really listening to other adoptive parents, I started listening to the voices of adoptees and birth mothers. And it was through them. And one of my good friends, her name is Ashley Mitchell. She is a huge advocate for birth mothers here on Instagram and beyond. And it was through her that I really learned a lot about Mm -hmm. how to love well and do and pursue adoption well. Mm -hmm. Um, So from there, we took a step back and I felt like we would dive in, like kind of step, take a couple months back and hopefully dive in soon after that, um, after we walked away, which was December I think 2018 or maybe either 2018 or 2019. Um, But uh, I, I knew that we had to take a step back and I thought we would jump back in once we found somebody we wanted to work Mm -hmm. with, but God was just leading us a different way. And through those about three years before we got to our foster care story, I just, listened and learned from those who have been on the harder side of the adoption triad and I just told myself because people because we would receive messages from Facebook and Instagram multiple times telling us about 
a foster care situation or an adoption situation and if we were interested and I mean they you have to be cautious with that and discern that and so I remember telling Terry and I, I said this multiple times because people would ask us when we would start pursuing again and I would just say you know God's going to have to send it to us because I can't picture myself pursuing this again, mm. you know, like the situation will have to come to us for somebody in need rather than me trying to go seek out that, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and I also said that I don't think that I could pursue adoption at this point in our life again. I think that we need to pursue something or choose something that is has a child that is really in need and to mm -hmm. me that would be foster care so that's what I that's that were my two requests I'm like it's gonna have to be sent to us and it's gonna have to be foster care because I know that those children are the most in need mm -hmm. and so that's what happened last summer and um it's it's crazy to think back that that's how it, it happened and came to us yeah, that's amazing. And just that you recognize too, okay, this is, this is what I need. And this is what I really want to pursue and to choose right now for our family and for where we see ourselves going. Can you walk us through a little more practically? Like what is foster care? Like what is the process of, of getting connected? Because I really, you know, I don't hear about this a lot. Mm -hmm. You know, I have a one set of friends where they've, they've talked a little bit about it, but that's been my first exposure. Oftentimes I might see news articles, you know, around like, negative situations or problems mm -hmm. with the system, but I don't really know. And I'm sure those are listening to some may know, some may not know, like, what does it actually look like to pursue this option? Yeah. Um, when I think about foster care and just like socially and nationally in our country, like what that looks like, um, it's really the, the messy part that a lot of people you know, nobody wants to have to be in a situation like that. So it is, it is a lot of times not really heard of because mm -hmm. they're really, um, there are a lot of families out there who do pursue foster care, but it's, it's not as much as there should be. Mm -hmm. And um, it is the, the messier side of, of our society. And it's really sad. Um, so to pursue foster care, foster care is families who foster parents who stand in the gap for other families who are having a tough time um, and their kids are put into the foster care system. And so foster parents are that like beacon. They, they kind of, they are there to love those children as their own while their families um, overcome whatever situation there there may be whatever reason they the kids were put into the system mm -hmm. so for for uh, foster care the goal should always be reunification that like your mindset as a foster parent mm -hmm. you should always um be hopeful for reunification because that's that's the best outcome for families to reunite you know like mm -hmm. the bible the prodigal son like we everyone loves to see a family coming back together and just living in love and overcoming whatever hard times there is mm -hmm. and so that's not it it doesn't always end in reunification so kind of to step back and talk about how to become a foster parent mm -hmm. there is a process um, you have to have a home study done um, there's a checklist of all kinds of things you have to get done home study um, background checks um, you have to take classes and there there's a lot so when we were presented with the foster care situation we kind of had to go through a um, like a fast track <laughs> to be able to welcome the children in our home. Mm -hmm. And since having them, we've had to complete certification. And uh, so, yeah, you have to become certified 
as a foster parent. Do you know, is it more common for reunification or is it fairly common for our foster parents to become the legal parents of these children? Is that, I mean, I know that's kind of a broad question and maybe it depends yeah. state to state, but yeah, what would that look like or what does it normally look like right now? So a lot of times reunification reunification does happen because mm -hmm. the state, um, especially depending in what state you live in, uh, they, the state wants to see reunification happen, even though a lot of times um, it shouldn't because the situation didn't, isn't there yet. Um, mm -hmm. There still needs to be a lot more healing, a lot more overcoming on the uh, birth family side. So what happens a lot of times is reunification happens and then children will go back into the system and it'll be like a vicious cycle. Yeah. Um, but in a lot of other situations, adoption does happen. Okay. Okay. It's just so fascinating to hear more about because I know like just really, truly like your experience and sharing so much on social media, I've been learning a lot and better understanding what does this really look like? Do you have contact with the birth family or is that something that you, you work through like a, like a counselor or some middle person for that yeah. conversation? Um, so we have multiple ways of contact. Um, okay. There are, we do have family visits where the children are able to go visit their mom and um, we also have contact through my through text messaging um, we FaceTimed and uh, email is pretty much our main way of contact so then you have an opportunity to like update these birth parents or parent around like how your child's doing sending photos those types of things oh yes it's very very encouraged because okay whether it becomes reunification or adoption that that's the state like you know that's that's the state calling the shots in that area but relationship is always you know that's on us relationship is on me and Terry and then their family and to make sure that the children are benefiting the best that they could from the situation mm -hmm. that they're in and that um my desire is to keep that bond between them and their mother. And uh, that's something that I've learned through walking away from adoption and really listening to birth families' voices and adoptees' voices, how important it is for relationship. Any way mm -hmm. that, that, you know, you, you do have to consider safety and the best interest of the child, but to always have that openness. Openness is very, um, very big with that. Yeah. That was one of my thoughts popping up as you were saying this, you know, what about safety or if there are issues where, you know, if you think a child needs care for, let's say like mental health services or something, because the transition is harder, they're navigating something and you disagree or the birth parent disagrees. Do you, do you try to come to an agreement about a decision or ultimately is that on you to make those decisions as you see fit that's best for the child or um, children it, we are supposed to um discuss things like that with okay. the birth family um our biological family um a lot of times we you know if they wake up with a snotty nose or i just take them to the doctor and i and i let our caseworker know of doctor visits appointments um and also our caseworker also keeps us up to date of it looks like their annual appointment is coming up oh, okay you need a book that and uh so yeah okay so you have that support with the caseworker to do that too yeah wow I mean that's that is a huge testament to you and all the work and all the checkpoints that you have to go through as the foster parent and saying okay I have this person checking in I'm checking in with this other person and I'm making sure I'm checking in on my own home life and how things are going too those are a lot of different pieces yeah. That you're, yeah. that you're navigating. Yes, definitely. <laughs> it is. So you've mentioned before with the, and you had a post recently where you shared that you just see of some of the brokenness in the foster care system. Mm -hmm. And you said it, it can depend state to state, but for Louisiana specifically, you've just seen some things that have been really hard. Mm -hmm. um, would you be willing to speak to that just a little bit more in what you 
have experienced or mean by that and just the things that you'd love to see addressed by yes. the state, by communities? Yes, of course. Um, it's It was a really hard process to get us certified as a foster family. And um, we have provided everything for our babies. And uh, one of the, I've, and I've heard multiple stories since being a foster parent, how the state doesn't always provide what is needed for foster families. So sometimes it just kind of feels like we're on our own and, but we're having to do everything that we're supposed to do. We're, we're supposed to, um, you know, we have requirements and we have to make sure our requirements are met. And um, sometimes the state could be very lenient on the other side of the aisle and it could just be very difficult. It, it's hard to not get your mind and heart wrapped up in all of it. Um, also, there, there are times that I've really tried to advocate for, it, it's a back and forth of advocating for their mom and advocating for the children. And it's been very hard advocating because I ha haven't always received the resources or the answers that I've wanted to. Mm -hmm. um, so it kind of can sometimes feel like I'm trying to hold it all together, do the best I can without crumbling <laughs> in the midst of it. Um, but praise God for who he is and getting us through. Um, but yeah, I, I would say the state lacks um, resources they they don't have as many workers as they need so they're very overloaded so me and my caseworker we have a very good relationship and she's been awesome and has done the absolute best she could do but she could only do so much yeah yeah so, yeah a lot of dynamics at play then for you know not having as much support as needed but then also some of a disconnect, it sounds like with the state and then actually seeing the needs of these families and these kids and what they have and the role that you play. So you play such a huge role. I just in hearing you talk about this and the, the many different hats that you're wearing and organizing and strategy that's required beyond just saying, okay, I need to also be present to these children yeah. and wanting to be present to them, to love them and care for them and helping them feel that security and that safety. Yeah. So yeah. what would you recommend for someone listening? And they're thinking, this sounds like a really good fit. Like, this sounds like what God is calling us to. Like, how do you go about, or what would you recommend discerning foster care? Like questions that would be good to ask yourself and your spouse, if you're thinking that this is the path you want to go on. Yes. Um, first and foremost, I would research, re research your state. Um, if you could connect to foster parents in your area, ask them questions, um, kind of create a community if you can. Um, secondly, you have to get certified. Uh, I, even though I wouldn't change anything that has happened, um, I definitely think that it would have been easier in some ways if we were certified before like completely certified before receiving the case mm. um but I knew I know that it played out the way that it needed to um because time was of the essence for us um so if you are in a situation similar to us I don't want to discourage you not to pursue it just advocate for yourself you need to advocate for yourself and your family and even be on the lookout for the other side, um, their family, their parents, because uh, you want to make sure that everything is happening as ethically as it could, that um, both parties, the, the foster children and their, their parents are receiving the resources that they need and um, just pray and discern and ask the Holy Spirit to guide you because we need, we need the Holy Spirit um, in any venture, any venture of life. Yeah. I love that. I love that response. It's like, okay, do the research, you know, figure out those practical pieces and invite God into that whole process to really sit with and see, okay, is this what he's calling you to do? Because he will equip you mm -hmm. to do this. 
Could you give us, as we're wrapping up this interview, could you give us a little bit more around favor fertility in your ministry and what you offer so that for those listening that they're thinking, I really need this community. Wait, tell me more. Yes. Tell us more. <laughs> yes. So favor has been such a gift. Um, it's been an honor that God has gifted me with this ministry. And when I started it, I definitely had a vision of what I, what God was calling me to do. And so, um, we have two in-person so, um, support gatherings in the Baton Rouge area. So where I'm from and in Atlanta, Georgia, that they just launched in, I want to say maybe April. And that's been a powerful group. And then we, if you aren't local to either one of those areas we have an online gathering that meets once a month each group meets once a month and uh we have an online gathering and it has been so powerful so basically what favor is and how we go about it is i welcome everyone in whether it's online or through uh, in person and we do praise and worship I do, we, after praise and worship, I allow everyone to introduce themselves, especially if there's newcomers. And I also encourage people, the ladies to share their testimony. If there's a testimony that has happened, um, because that's how we overcome by the blood of the lamb and the word of our testimony. And after that, I go into a teaching that I prepare usually that day that God, the Holy spirit leads me. Um, and it's usually focused around um, deliverance and healing because this mm -hmm. is a deliverance and healing ministry and uh, just how to access the power of the Holy Spirit, how to um, incorporate our faith in our everyday life and how to transform your mind um, with a, a kingdom minded mindset. Because that's very important, the way we talk, the what, what we do, how we act, to really um, just believe. Because our faith is not just of talk, but it is of power. So that is what favor is about. And could you just speak to who can participate in this group? Because maybe someone's listening and hearing your story and thinking, okay, I don't, I haven't, I, maybe I had moments of infertility or struggles with that current struggles right now, miscarriage loss. Um, who's, who is this group specifically um, targeted towards and serving right now? So we serve women who are needing healing. So women who are believing for miracles in their womb, women who are needing healing from um, past trauma that infertility may have brought whether you're married or you're single and you are battling with your fertility, you don't have to be married to join our group. We have women who have come who are not married and they are believing for their fertility. They're believing for Jesus to heal their bodies. And um, we've had people come in the group. Some of our biggest miracles and deliverances have been women who have come to our group who have accidentally just stumbled on in oh and <laughs> yes it's been so amazing so I don't really like to um put like a like a box around who could come mm -hmm. um, if if anybody listening listening is feeling drawn to this group you may be someone who has had multiple children and maybe you need some type of healing for something that um you know, that has to do with fertility. You never, you mm -hmm. never know. Um, so yeah, that, that's who we serve. That's so beautiful. I'm so grateful that you said yes to the Holy spirit and leading this ministry. Cause just hearing you talk about it, I'm like, oh my gosh, I can think of so many women who, <laughs> yes. who need your group or who have sought, who have said and, and spoken around. I wish a group like this existed. So I didn't yes. feel so alone in my journey. Yes. Yes. And that, that is why I started it for women like like them and also um a couple of times a year we also invite the couples to come because and that's those those gatherings have been so powerful um because it's about authority 
uh, in the spiritual realm. And we know our husbands have such authority over the family as head of household. So we've seen miracles really take place when the husbands come to. That's awesome. Thank you so much for sharing your story here today and for all the work that you're doing online and in person to support women and to be a foster mom. It's so beautiful to hear your story and to learn more about it. I've learned so much today. So thank you so much for taking your time to be with me. It's been a joy. Of course. I had so much fun. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much for listening. Please subscribe, share with your friends, and help expand the conversation around women's health. If you'd like to learn more about fertility awareness, visit www.managingyourfertility.com for more information, resources, guides, and so much more.